I cannot, cannot do it. I, I'll tell you what, this morning I, I know I will not be as entertaining as they were. I hope to be at least as focused as they were, but I know I won't be as entertaining. I'll tell you what, that's beautiful. I love to see it. Uh, that's good stuff. Uh, I know that uh, this afternoon y'all may not remember any of the points from the sermon this morning, but you will all be talking about that. So uh, that's, uh, that's all right. Hey, it's great to see everybody here this morning. Uh, what a great day to be in God's house. Amen. Uh, let's all stand up and shake hands and tell somebody how glad we are to see him here.
let's continue singing hymn number 58, Standing on the Promises. <laughs> On the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm
draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise done or not is it the lights on so it's good all right good to be here again this morning how about you are y'all glad to be here this morning uh, sounds like maybe i'll go with maybe well by the end of the day i hope it's a all out yes all right all right it's great to be here this morning we're Almost done with the book of Ephesians. We'll be finishing it up next week. Completely done next week. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about authority and what the Bible says about authority. And um, I hope, I hope that uh, we will all get something out of this this morning that we can use, that we can take with us and apply it to our lives. And I believe that we all can. Now, what is authority? Does anybody here know? Definitively, what that word means? Well, I looked it up. All right? I thought I knew, and I was pretty close. All right? Three definitions I found for the word authority the power to determine, to adjudicate, or otherwise settle issues or disputes. All right? That's, that, that makes sense with what I thought authority was. Another definition is that authority. Um, represents persons having the legal power to make and enforce the law. When someone says, I'm going to turn you over to the authorities, that's who they're talking about, right? People who enforce the law, people who make and enforce the law. And another definition is an accepted source of information, advice, etc. Right? You say he is an authority on that subject. He is someone that I would go to for information on that subject. I would go to for advice in that realm of life. Okay? So those are some definitions for the word authority. Now, where does authority come from? God, right? Authority comes from God. Think. All right. In in Romans 13... We read, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. Right? Have you ever, I was talking to Josh the other day, I was working through all this, and we were talking about some things, and and I said, this morning when I opened the back door of the car to buckle Jack's seatbelt, he went. And I thought, what are you doing? What are you doing? I know 99 out of 100 times I open that back door to buckle his seatbelt, he does this. Like, go ahead, buckle it. It's all good. But that morning he did this, and I knew, uh-oh, that's a sign. That's a sign that he's done something that he is thinking is going to get him a whipping right that's the way we are if you're driving the speed limit and obeying all the laws you know your top your license is up to date all your lights are working on the back of your car your tags on the back are not expired everything is good you see a policeman you wave hey how's it going jim but if you know that you are speeding or there's something wrong there's something expired there's trouble when you see the policeman, you do this. Act like you didn't, you just kind of drive by, looking at the rearview mirror, messing with something, you know, making sure you don't make eye contact, hoping that you go unnoticed, right? When, we're, when we have nothing to worry about, we have nothing to fear. When we haven't done anything wrong, we don't, we're not worried about the authorities. I remember there was a teacher in my high school named Miss Cook, and she hated, hated, chewing gum she hated chewing gum and if you were walking down the hallway and miss cook made eye contact with you and you had chewing gum in your mouth it was over your life was about to drastically change okay so miss cook could tell from your eyes if you went she'd go spit it out if you're like miss cook she just lets go on by i learned quickly to go Miss Cook, no matter what, right? Because she was a smart lady. She had picked up on that. When she saw the fear in your eyes, she knew what was going on. She knew that you had something to hide. And that's what Paul's talking about here. If we're afraid and we're a terror, in terror of the authorities, then two, one of two things is going on. Either we have done something wrong or that authority is being misused, right? Now, do you think, Adolf Hitler was not a good authority figure. He misused the authority that the people of Germany gave to him, and they were wrong in giving it to him in the first place. I know last week I heard of a story of a, of a, of a ninth grade teacher at one of the middle schools here in Saline County who stood before the class and he said, Jesus Christ is a myth. Was he making proper use of the authority that had been given to him by the state of Arkansas? Absolutely not. He said, evolution makes is a proven fact. Was he making proper use of the authority given to him by the state of Arkansas? Absolutely not. And I can assure you that I will be following up on this. Because I want to ensure that he knows that he has overstepped his bounds. He has taken the authority that's been entrusted to him and he has abused it. And young lives are at stake. Why will I do that? Because I believe I've been given some authority that I want to be responsible for those young lives. None of my students were in that class. However, there were students in there that Jesus died for. All right? And it's our responsibility to take up the mantle and do what's right. As authority figures, we are always to do that. And if you are a parent or an adult, you're an authority to someone. Authority is something that is, is a very complex idea. And this morning, we're going to take a look at some things that deal with authority. Whether that authority is over us, 
or whether that authority has been entrusted to us. We're going to take a look at that this morning. So if you please stand with me as we read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9 together. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up into the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does this he will receive back from the lord whether he is slave or free masters do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him heavenly father god thank you so much for this day you've given to us god we pray that today you will speak to our hearts god that your word will be so clear to us today lord we thank you for all those that are here this morning god i pray that none of us leave here in the same state that we arrived god we love you we praise you we thank you for who you are we thank you for jesus what he did for us on the cross and we ask all these things in his holy and precious name amen you may be seated children obey your parents and all god's people said right that's a that's a that's an idea none of us have any problems with, right? Parents. <laughs> it's not a revolutionary idea. When Paul said that, people didn't go, oh, what? Even way back, way back in the Ten Commandments, when Moses came down and he said, these are the commandments, and he got to that first commandment that dealt with, with relationships between people, and this was the first commandment with a promise attached to it, and he said, honor your father and mother. People didn't go, what? I didn't know. People, that's something that that God has built into us. When you're a child, you depend on your father and mother. Otherwise, you die. You cannot survive without them. In fact, children who don't have a father and mother are the one of the two groups that Jesus said, you have to take care of these. You have to. You have to fill that role. If you don't have one or the other, you might be able to survive. If if you're a husband without a wife, you can survive. But if you're a child without parents, you will not survive. God said you have to take care of these children who don't have parents. They need you. This is a big deal. Parents are a have-to kind of thing. Someone to take care of you as you're a child. You have to have that. And as you grow up, hopefully you appreciate that. And it turns into honor and respect. That's a natural progression. But here God says, just do it. Children, obey your parents. Everyone knew that respect for one's parents was necessary. And everyone knows it today. A lot of us pretend we don't know it. Or we act like it's not important. But listen... Remember what Paul says here, what Paul points out here is that was the very first commandment that had a promise attached to it. God said, this is so important, I'm going to make you a promise. If you do this, that your days will be long in the land that I've given you. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long. Now we may say, well, I knew somebody that honored their father and mother that didn't. Whatever. Listen. Listen to the contrary, to the, back, to, the, to the back side of that promise, okay? Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that I've given you. What does that mean? That if you do that, your days will be long. And what does it also mean? If you don't, your days will be shorter. This is a promise from God. This is something that he felt was important because it truly is. Honoring one's parents is important because how you 
deal with that very first authority figure in your life will determine the outcome of everything else you do. Because problems generally do not come from this or that or this or that. They come from a lack of respect for authority. People who rob banks, it's not that they do not have a respect for the bank. They do not have a respect for the authority of the law. Whether it be God's law or man's law, they don't respect either one. Children who get into trouble at school constantly and constantly and constantly, it's generally a dealing, a, a problem that comes from the fact that they don't respect authority. Because they haven't been taught that at home, whatever. I don't know where, why it's happened, but it's generally a problem with authority. I don't respect the teacher's authority. When the she says yes, I say no. I don't care what the question was. When he says right, I say left. Why? Because I like to buck authority. Listen, sometimes, like I said earlier, Nazi Germany would have been a great time for people to stand up. Sometimes the authority that is uh, being yielded or, or wielded is in direct contrast, contrast to God's Word. And good people need to stand up and say, this is wrong. When Saul, the first king there, right? Saul the king, when he did not follow God's word, did Samuel go, well, I can't say anything because he is the king. God made him the king and that's the authority that's been given to him. So I've got to be completely quiet. No. Samuel said, you did wrong. And God is going to take your crown. Defiance for the sake of defiance is wrong. Defiance for your own personal satisfaction is wrong. But, some, but defiance that comes from a holy indignation because someone is standing against the will of God or the word of God, that's our responsibility. All right? Now, the second point that Paul makes, this is the one, okay? Okay? This is the deal. This is what we would call like some kind of crazy, psycho, way wacky, revolutionary statement. Okay? Because remember, we did not come of it from a time when children ruled the home. That's where we're at. This is not where this scripture was written. At this time, did children rule the home? No. Today, you know the most powerful demographic? Children. From 4 to 14, that's the demographic that every advertising agent in the world is targeting. Why? Because they control the purse strings. They control mom and dad. Do mom and dad go on date nights? Nope. We don't have time for date nights. We're too busy going to dance practice and football practice and soccer practice and all those different practices. And those are for parents who only have one kid. Right? Today, children are cherished. They're even elevated to a point that they don't really need to be. But at the time Paul wrote this, children were property. They were considered property. If you had a daughter and you didn't really want a daughter, what'd you do? You took her out in the woods and left her. Nothing wrong with that. Get rid of her. That's the way they thought. That's not the way Paul thought, but that's the way society felt. Children are property. We are to use them to meet the needs of the family. And if they don't meet those needs, we get rid of them. And listen to what Paul said. He said, honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then in verse 4, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He's saying, fathers, show respect to your children as you expect them to show respect to you. Mutual respect. Is that a crazy way out idea? Yeah, at the time it was. To deal with children in mutual respect. You see, authority works best when there is mutual respect. Have you ever been a supervisor? Anybody here ever been a supervisor or a manager? 
Now you see those supervisors or managers that seem to really have an iron thumb and they put people where they want them and everybody's scared of them and afraid of them. And what happens when they walk through, everybody goes. They get busy. They, do, they hide whatever they were doing before. They hang up on their wives. All that stuff, right? And then when they're gone, what happens? Go right back to it. They go right back to doing whatever it was they wanted to do in the first place. You know, parents and children who have that same relationship. I knew guys in high school. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir, Father, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. I'll get right to it, sir. And as soon as dad was out the room, he said, man, I ain't got to listen to what that stupid. And they start down on their dad. Talking bad about them. Doing exactly what they knew their dad didn't want them to do. Not because they wanted to do it, but just to show that sorry. That's no way to have a relationship with a, uh, between a father and son or a father and daughter or mother. And... Listen, respect, mutual respect. When your child has respect for you because you've shown that you do care about them and you say, go do this. And they say, yes, sir, I will. And they do it not out of fear, but out of respect and out of honor. That's when this thing works correctly. In the first century, children did not have DHS and scan on speed dial to make sure their parents stayed in line, right? Parents could do what they wanted. And Paul said, you know what? You want your children to grow up to be responsible, loving Christians? Raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, the nurture and admonition of the Word of God. Don't raise them with an iron fist, but raise them with a loving home where they know that there are consequences for bad actions. But those consequences are done not out of anger, but out of love. Don't provoke your kids to wrath. Have any of y'all ever provoked your children to wrath? Larry has. I'll make you that promise. I've done it. I've put my kids in situations that they cannot win. And you know, I hate to be put in that situation. I had a boss one time that said, just tell me you're an idiot. Just say it. Say, I'm an idiot. Say it. Say it. Finally, I said, okay, I'm an idiot. I mean, I had no other way out. And then I walked back in the storeroom and broke a couple of stuff. I walked off. I was mad. I was fuming. I was about to cry. I was so angry. That's wrath. That is destructive anger. It's a bad thing for a child to feel that way, especially where his parents are concerned. That's what coaches are for. I'm just kidding. Now listen. When Paul says don't provoke your children but rather use discipline and instruction together as a means of training them. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, he, makes, he goes a little bit further and he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Because when you beat them down and beat them down and beat them down, what eventually happens? They start thinking they're dirt. Nobody wants that. You want your kids to be successful. You want your kids to grow up and be all the things that you are and more but when we constantly beat them down and beat them down and beat them down they just become discouraged now listen i i told you before i'm not perfect i have caused my children to be angry i have provoked my kids to wrath i have been provoked by my kids to wrath so i know what you're thinking I know what you're going through. I know all those thoughts that are coming back into your mind about all the times that you've been frustrated by your children, embarrassed by your children, confused, enraged by your kids, scared to death. Times that you've been caused to feel heartbroken and sad because of things your kids have done or said. And I know that I felt proud 
I felt loved and joyful, blessed, moved, encouraged by things my kids have said too. Because you see, the thing about children is they're people. Just like us. And I know what it feels like to say, my kid would never act like that. And then turn around and see my kid acting just like that. And I know how humiliating that can be. But we have to remember as parents that our kids are just little us. They're going to mess up just like we did and just like we still do. And when they do, we encourage them. We discipline them. And we remember what God's Word has told us. Don't provoke them to wrath. Don't beat them down to the point where they become discouraged. But rather, nurture and admonition through the Word of God. And in the Word of God living through us. That's how we're supposed to deal with our kids. In mutual respect. That's the message of all these scriptures. Mutual respect. It's a natural byproduct of love. And I know you love your kids. And kids, I know you love your parents. So we all need to start acting more like that. This week's message is not going to make you a perfect parent. It's not going to make you kids a perfect, you know, angelic cherub of a child living in the home. That's not going to happen. I know that. Just like last week's message didn't make any of us perfect husband or wife. But when we think about these messages and we pray over them in our hearts and we go back and we read God's word over and over again, what happens is we get better and better at the jobs he's given us. Never going to be perfect. But I guarantee you, I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. I want to be a better father to Jack than I was to Tyler. You know, Robert Francis used to always say, your first child should just be named Experiment. He was right. I think it's your first three or four children should just be named Experiment 1, 2, 3, and 4. Listen, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to know it all. We're not going to figure it all out just sitting here today and walk out of here and everything just go from being humdrum to being magnificent. But we make strides every day. One of the ways we do that is by... Stop stopping the masks and the pretending and the putting on airs and putting on this face before everyone else. You know what I'm talking about? Any of y'all ever whipped your kid because somebody watching you thought you should? I remember when I was a little boy in Orion Missionary Baptist Church. I was sitting there not doing a single thing wrong. And my mom reached over and popped me across the mouth. And I was like, what? I was just reading the hymnal. During the sermon, but still, I wasn't, wasn't burning anybody or anything like that. And afterwards, I was like, why did you hit me? She said, well, Myrtle looked at me and I thought she meant that you needed a whooping. So I whopped you. <laughs> what? That makes no sense at all. I mean, but I've done it too. It's like you're standing there and your kid's doing something that you don't really care, but you look over and there's so and so over there watching, going, mm, "Boy, I tell you, if he don't whoop that kid. He ain't. He don't know Jesus. I'll tell you that." So you grab your, you grab your, you're like, "I can't believe you did it." He's like, "Why are you doing? I do this all the time." You've never said anything before. I'm like, yeah, well, he wasn't there before. <laughs> Tearing him up. We try to act a certain way around certain people. We confuse our children. Have you ever hid things or lied about things about your kids to try to impress somebody? And your kids knew you were doing it? So you're telling them you really ought to be ashamed of this part of your life or this thing that you do without actually saying it? That's discouraging to a kid. That's discouragement in a, in a very big way. If you were a big football star and your son plays in the band and he plays the flute 
and you and your son, what did you? Hey, what what position did your son play? And you say, oh, he he don't he don't play football anymore. Yeah, he hurt his knee, so he can't play anymore. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. And your son's going, what? I never played football. I never hurt my knee. I play the flute. I'm great at playing the flute. In fact, I'm going to college for free because I can play this flute so well. And what you said to your son is, I'm embarrassed and ashamed of the fact that you're not a football like I was. You didn't follow in your old man's steps. That's a terrible thing to do, and that's a horrible message to give to our kids. But just in case we leave anybody out, you kids, students, have you ever dishonored your parents just to make your friends think more highly of you? You ever call your mom or dad a name behind their back just so your, your buddies will think you were cool? Or act like you're dis... Oh, <laughs> I had a friend one time that acted like he was disobeying his parents even though he wasn't just because he wanted people to think he was more edgy. That's dishonoring. Even if you're not dis- disobeying your parents, you're acting like you are, so you're dishonoring your parents. I tell you what, the idea of honor in our society is just wacky. It's wacko. I was student teaching. I was going to be a math teacher once. (laughs) And I was student teaching at Sheridan High School, my alma mater. And it was only a few years after I graduated. And I was there with a lady that I loved very much. Bobby Graves was a great teacher and she was my my teacher, and she was Cindy's parents' teacher. She had been there for like 90, 95 years, teaching school, great lady. And I was in her classroom, and I was student teaching, and one of the students stood up, yelled like the queen mother of all curse words, and threw a book at Miss Graves. And Miss Graves said, Larry, can you take the class for a little while? And she grabbed the girl's hand and took her down to the, to the office. And I thought, well, that girl's going to prison. <laughs> and five minutes later, the girl was back in class. And you know what? I've seen kids talk to their parents the same way. At football games at the lake, different places, all over, at the mall, whatever. You can't have that. And they just blow up and talk to their parents like they are dirt, like they are scum. Like I wouldn't talk to somebody that was, <laughs> that really was scum. If that was possible, I wouldn't, I just can't imagine how someone would talk. I would never have said something like that to my dad. For one reason, I was smarter than that. But for another reason, I wouldn't do it. I said something to my dad one time, and I knew it hurt his feelings after I said it. I wasn't even trying to hurt his feelings, but I said it, it hurt his feelings. And he looked at me, and I wished that I would have died right then. I felt like dirt, because that was my dad. Listen, honor for your parents. Honor comes from respect. And we're to respect our kids while we exercise authority over them. And our kids are supposed to respect us while they recognize and respect that authority as well. And get, listen, we hurt the ones we love and in order to gain approval of somebody else that we probably don't even like in the first place. What are we doing? We are not respecting God's authority. God's authority. God put your parents over you. And you say, yeah, but my parents are not good parents. My boss is not a good boss, whatever. Is God sovereign or is God not sovereign? If God is sovereign, then we respect His authority. That's the way it works. And when we don't, respect our parents, and we don't remember how God told us about how to raise our children, 
It's not them that we're disrespecting. It's God. It's His authority that we're diminishing. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. And we don't need to do it. Let's move on. Slavery is no longer really a part of our culture. Sadly, there are still, there are still slaves in the world, but it's not legal anymore. Uh, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing. Uh, human trafficking is going on all over the planet. That's not really what Paul's talking about here, okay? He's talking about something that was a part of the culture, that's slavery. And that's really no longer a part of our, of our world. And I'm thankful to God that that's true. But we can still learn a lot from verses 5 through 9. So when you see that word slaves, don't think, well, I'm not a slave. I don't have any slaves, so this doesn't apply to me. Listen to the words. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Whether you're a slave or free. How many of you in here are free? So it applies to you too. Do a good job. Why? Because you work for Jesus. That's the way it works. That's the way it really truly is. You are His, and you need to act like it. So at work, you should be the best employee in the place. The best employee in the whole place should be you. Shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? Because when your boss looks around, and he sees you hiding out, loafing, not ever doing your job, what does that say to him? You're of a very low moral quality and character. You want to get paid for nothing because you feel like that company owes you something. So what does that say to him about your faith? It's not, not anything he really needs to investigate because it's not really not the kind of person he wants to be. But when you are the best employee in the place, you're respectful. You work hard. doesn't matter if the boss is on vacation or not. You're still doing your job. You're still working hard. You're not doing it for eye service. You're not doing it to please men. You're doing it to please God. Because you work for Him. He is the one you represent at home, at church, in the workplace, at the store, everywhere you go. If we will just remember that. Imagine how God can use our testimony in the community. Not for eye service. Not to please people. To please God. And then look at the next part here. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And that there is no partiality with him. Bosses. I know there's some bosses in the room. Don't take advantage of your position. Don't take advantage of your employee. Treat them with the mutual respect that you expect from them. Don't make idle threats. Stop your threatening. I had a boss once that used to make idle threats all the time to try to get his way. I had no respect for him as a person. I respected his position because I worked for his company. As a boss, we are to be clear about what we expect and be fair in our decisions and remember that God loves the employees just as much as he does the employers. There is no partiality in him or with him or about him. So let's think about four things here this morning. Now, if you're a child, if you're a child in this room, you're to respect your parents' authority, right? 
You respect authority. So that doesn't mean that you can say, I respect my parents' authority, but when I go to school, I'm going to treat those teachers like dirt. No. That's not the message that we've gotten from this text, is it? We are to respect authority. Now, if you are a child in a classroom and there's a teacher that gets up and says something crazy like Jesus Christ is a myth and evolution is a proven fact of science, what do you do? Do you stand up and say, "Uh oh, you're stupid. No. Don't do that. You go to the principal and you say, principal, here's what's happening in this class. You respect the authority of of the teacher while you're in class and you remember that his authority has been given to him by the principal. And his authority has been given to him by the superintendent. And his authority has been given to him by the school board. And their authority has been given to them and it goes up and up and up and eventually you get to the point where it's in God's sovereign hands. All right, But you follow the chain of command. Don't stand up and be disrespectful because then you're doing a poor job of representing your Savior. You go about it the right way. Because let me tell you something, if you stand up in class and go, oh, you're, you're stupid, you're going to be in trouble. And whatever you say happen in there is going to be suspect. But when you say to your fellow students, you know what he said in there, I don't think that was right. I'm going to go to the principal. And if any of you want to come with me, you're welcome to. And you go to the principal. And if you go alone, that's great. If the whole class goes with you, that's great. But you go to the principal and you say, here's exactly what happened in class. And you trust that principal to do what's right. And if the principal sweeps it under the rug and says, you know, I agree with him. Then what do you do? Go to the next tower level. That's probably going to mean that you (laughs) get your parents to go to the next higher level because if you go walking across the property over to the administration building you may once again get into trouble right there are proper ways of handling every issue and we handle those issues properly if you're a parent your responsibility is to maintain your authority and do so by loving your children respecting your children appreciating the gift of your children that God has given you. Discipline, yes. Right? Discipline is important, very important. But tyranny is different than respect. I think we all understand that. If you're an employee, respect the authority of those over you. If you're a boss, remember that any authority you have is from God And uh, you are to use it as he has instructed you to do. Now, as we take a look at authority, we remember that what is the true source of authority? Josh said it a while ago. God. What is the absolute authority on this earth? God's word. This is the authority. And you may know a theologian that is so smart it's ridiculous. And he may have 75 PhDs from seminaries all over the southern United States. And he may be able to talk so well it makes you just want to pass out. But his authority is absolutely zero compared to this. And you may have had teachers in the past that have told you something or taught you something or a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, whoever it may have been, they've told you something And you trusted it. And then you read in God's word something that causes you to question that. Where does the authority lie? Right here. So even if it was me, what do you do? You go to me and you say, Brother Larry, what you said doesn't jive with what I'm reading in God's word. You got some explaining to do. And hopefully, I'll say, well, context of the scripture, the blah, 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 whatever it was that caused the confusion, we can clear that out. Possibly I'll say, you know what, you're right, I was wrong. Or I could say, you know, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but 
that Bi- the Bible's wrong. See, that's where you get to a problem. That's when you say, uh, you're out of here, buddy. I'm not listening to you anymore. Because where true authority lies is in Scripture. And that's the same way it should work in every level of authority. Eventually, you get to the absolute authority. If you're talking theology, this is the absolute authority. Doesn't matter really what you're talking about. Eventually, you get to the absolute authority, and that is sovereign God Almighty. All right? He is God. Next week, we're going to take a look at being fully prepared to do all these things that God's called us to do. All the book of Ephesians has been preparing us and telling us what we have to do, what we have to do, what we have to do. Next week, we're going to take a look at being prepared to do all these things. What does that preparation mean? look like in our lives. Then we're going to start something new that won't be a very long series, but we're going to start something new after that. There's a lot going on. There's a lot coming up. There's a lot in this book. This book as a whole and just this book of Ephesians. There's a lot there. And if we get finished with this series and we say, wow, that was good, we're not respecting the authority of God's Word. If we get finished with this series and we are applying this word to our lives every day to the best of our ability, are we going to be perfect? No, but we're trying every day to apply this message to our lives. Because this is truly the word of God. All the authority in the universe lies right here. That's proper respect for this word just a moment we're going to have an invitation i know some of this has been a a strange message this morning uh to follow with an invitation maybe today god's spoken to you about how you deal with your kids maybe he's talked to some of you children about how you deal with your parents maybe he's talking to some of us uh employees about being employees who worry more about the boss seeing us working and he does, than we do about representing Christ well and doing the work that we've been paid to do. And maybe we're here this morning and we're one of those employers that has been trying to run things with an iron fist and worried about being feared more than we are about representing Christ well as the authority figure in the place. Whatever it is. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, I pray that during this invitation, you will take the opportunity to respond to him. If you're here this morning and God has spoken to you today or maybe this week in personal study or whatever about something else, that I pray that today you will respond to him and let him have his way in your life. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, just for allowing us to be here together study a portion of your word god we know that authority is a tough thing but we like to have authority but sometimes we don't like to answer to authority but lord thank you for reminding us this morning that all authority lies in you and god we pray this morning that you will help us help us to represent you well in the way we wield authority And in the way that we yield to authority in our daily lives. God, because we know that there are people who will see what we do. And in that, they will make judgments about you. And God, that's a huge responsibility. And Lord, we know that we're not not really worthy of that. But God, this is what you've given us. And we thank you so much for the opportunity, for the privilege. God, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for who you are and for Jesus. We ask these things in his holy name. Amen. Please stand just for a moment. If you need to talk to somebody, I'm here. Brother Josh is up here. If you just need to come and pray, come and pray. If you need to pray where you are, pray where you are. If you just need to say, God, 
I heard you. Help me to do what you've said to my heart this morning. Whatever it is, if you want to come talk to me about salvation, about baptism, about anything, this is your time right now. No mountain, no valley, no gain or loss we know could keep us from your love, could keep us from your love. No sickness. No secret, no chain is strong enough to keep us from your love, to keep us from your love. As we continue our worship this morning, I want to ask the ushers to come forward. And um, had some great things happen this morning. We'll, we'll continue with our worship. We'll continue here this morning. This right here, this is part of our worship. As we re- recognize that everything we have, even the breath in our lungs, our families, our children, whatever's in our bank account or what's not in our bank account, it's all God's. We owe everything we are to our loving Father. And as we come this morning and take up our tithes and our offerings, that uh, we remember that. But that's why we do this. This is worship, for He is worthy. All right. Brother Roy, I want to ask you to uh, pray for our offering this morning. Father, just pray that it'll touch each and every one of our hearts, Father, to just, uh, we live for you and, and you only, Father. We just ask that you will bless this uh, offering that we're about to partake, Father. We just pray that we use it in, a, in the course of your will and just that uh, we all just give back to you for what you've given to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Let's sing that together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song. To him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. 
And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will... Let's sing that chorus again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. 